Thank you. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles this morning to Revelation chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. We're not going to stay here. We're going to go to another passage of Scripture, and I'll explain why in just a moment. Revelation chapter 12, and I'll start reading in verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. 
He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. What a glorious passage that is. As I was preparing this for today, and I was planning on taking the next section in Revelation, this phrase, the accuser of our brethren, kept coming up in my mind. And what is alarming about that phrase, the accuser of our brethren, is the persistence that Satan has in doing so. Notice what it says, who, who accused them before our God day and night. And we are not even aware of it. If the Lord had not put this in the scriptures, we really wouldn't be aware of it, except for a couple other scriptures. It's constant. Think about that for a moment. I don't know. I, day and night doesn't seem to be very applicable to heaven, but I believe it says that for our sake to show us that Satan is before God persistently, constantly accusing believers. I believe that is because it reflects upon believers and it also reflects upon the one in whom they believe. And Satan wants to destroy us. He wants to destroy God and his reputation. The same description of day and night, if you remember, is given in chapter 4 of Revelation of the four living creatures who have six wings and they are continually flying around the throne of God, crying out, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is to come. They don't rest day or night. That's how persistent Satan is. But his whole goal is not to elevate God, it's to bring him down because he wants the place of God. He dishonors God while we are to honor him. Back when I was in school, in college, as a young man in the university there, they, they did several major stage productions. For instance, they usually did one major opera every year. They did a Shakespearean play and multiple other things. And oftentimes in those major productions, they would use a backdrop on the stage that was made out of this fine mesh material, it's called a scrim. And it was used for primarily one purpose. They could paint, they could actually paint the backdrop, the scrim. And when the lights were shining on the front, you could not see anything in back of the scrim. But if the lights, if they had the, 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 uh, stage area behind the scrim lighted, you saw a whole other scene going on. One of the operas that they did while I was in school was Faust. And if you remember, Faust is Satan. And, or Mephistopheles is Satan. And in that 
particular opera, they use the scrim to show Satan in the background. The actors on the stage don't realize that he's there. They don't, you know what I'm saying, as far as actors go, they're, they're not aware that he's there. But he is back there influencing everything. It's like a, a scene behind the scene. And it's really showing that the most important scene is really what's going on behind because he's influencing everything. And what the Lord is showing us here in the book of Revelation is really the same thing. That's why he takes this little detour, not in the timing of, as I mentioned, as far as the events of Revelation, they'll just keep on going, but in, so that we understand what is behind all this and we understand it better. I, I believe that we are often not, we often don't realize how involved Satan is in the events of our lives. He is the enemy of our souls. He desires to lay a trap for us, snares along the way. And so what I want to do is I want to take a little bit of a reprieve from the book of Revelation, but it's not, an, it's not at all disassociated with it. It's very integral to it. And I want us to turn to Job chapter 1. Because here is one of the scriptures where we see exactly this going on. And the book of Job is an amazing story. It is a, it is a story about an incredible man. He's a, the Lord gives us a window into his life. He is a godly believer. The Bible describes him as blameless, upright, one who fears God and shuns evil. It says that twice. The first time it says it is showing us that that is his public testimony. The second time that that description is given is when God is speaking to Satan and he describes him as blameless, upright, one who fears God and shuns evil. Secondly, he is a wealthy man, unusually wealthy. He's the greatest and wealthiest man of all the people of the East. Thirdly, he's a model father. He had ten grown children who loved and respected him. And fourthly, he is a reputable man. He was highly respected by everyone that knew him. Children, adults, young adults, older adults. He was known for his wisdom. He was known for his generosity. He was known for his compassion. He had orphans that sat at his table every day that he took care of personally. However, we also know that through severe trials, he suffered the loss of his wealth. He suffered the loss of his children. And he suffered the loss of his reputation all in one day. And then a little while later, he also suffers his health. He's ext in extreme misery and pain with the boils that were all over his body. Now, that's the first story. <laughs> but that's not really the most important story. In the first and second chapter, we see a backdrop 
We start on earth as the Bible describes Job and his life and so forth. And then suddenly we're taken to this heavenly scene. And I want us to look at verse 6. I'm not going to read verses 1 through 5, which is really the description of his life. But now we go to that heavenly scene. Look at verse 6, and we're going to read down through verse 12. It says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the, on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So Satan answered the Lord and says, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But now, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is your is in your power, only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. I want, I want you to notice when he said, but now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, he didn't mention his person. He just mentioned, he had already described what he meant. You, you have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. You put a hedge around his household and around all that he has on every side. But he doesn't mention his person. So Satan didn't ask for that, but God placed that limitation on him. And remember that Satan or, or Job knew nothing of what was going on. Today, or we know more, far more than Job ever knew during his lifetime. He was not aware of this meeting that was going on between Satan and God, this conversation where his name was brought up. I want you to think about that for a moment. Job's now off the scene. He's not been living for thousands of years, we are on the scene. Whose name, whose name in this room has Satan brought up to God or has God mentioned? I am confident that our names have been brought before God. The same thing that took place then is taking place in our lives today, and we, we have seen it in other places in Scripture. Jesus revealed this when Peter rebuked him, and the Lord rebuked Peter in a way that revealed he was being used by Satan to keep Jesus from ac accomplishing his will. And he rebuked Peter and Satan at the same time. Speaking to Peter, he said, get thee behind me, Satan. So he was telling Peter, you're being used by Satan. What you are uh, wanting me to do is not in God's plan, it's in man's plan. But he was also rebuking Satan and letting Satan know, I know your wiles. 
I know what you're doing. It's almost like when he looked at Peter, he could see just behind him Satan working him over. And then later at the Passover meal, he said to Peter, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. And I'm very grateful for the next sentence. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. This is exactly what was happening to Job. In chapters 1 and 2 and throughout this book, but I want you to understand that Satan's name is mentioned 14 times in the book of Job. All 14 of those times are found in chapters 1 and 2. So after chapter 2, Satan is never spoken of. His name is not mentioned. He's not even referenced in a, in a you know, mysterious way. He's never spoken of after that. Which I think is very important for us to understand. So chapters 3 through 42. Satan is never brought up. And we never really go back to the heavenly courtroom in a sense other than in the last chapters where God himself speaks. But it, he speaks to Job where he is. He, there's nothing, there's not any heavenly vision. He just hears God speaking. And the most important part of the story about Peter is not so much that Satan was going to sift him but that God had given Satan permission to do so and that Jesus had prayed for him that his faith would not fail. The reason why that is so important is because human intercessors may fail us. And also this, human intercessors may pray for the wrong thing. Because we're, we're involved in people's lives, lives and we, we don't see necessarily the eternal perspective. We're always praying for what happens in this life. You know, take away the cancer. Don't let my child die. Don't let anything happen. <laughs> And if it was up to us, we wouldn't have any trials. We wouldn't have any. So oftentimes, even human intercessors don't really know what's going on in our lives. But thankfully, Jesus Christ does. Thankfully, the Holy Spirit does. And that's why it says that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And when we're tempted to sin, or when we do sin, either one, the Bible says we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who is advocating for us as believers. So Job chapter 1 verse 6 is where we see behind the scrim of Job's life, and we see how the throne room of God in heaven is really affecting the story going on on earth. But I want you to also note, at least from my experience, and God has not given this knowledge. He's not shown any of us, what's going on in heaven as far as our life goes. All he's done is given us this one scenario and several others that maybe are not as explicit so that we can apply it. We know what's going on. 
We know this is happening, although we don't know all the conversation that is being given, all the slander that's being given. God doesn't show us what's going on in heaven regarding our life for the same reason Job didn't know. It's important for us to at least know this dynamic is going on or else God wouldn't have shown us. He, but he needed to trust God's wisdom even as we do. So let's, let's look at this. First of all, we're going to look at who initiated these trials on Job. So notice in verse 6, what was it that brought the sons of God before the throne of God? I mentioned last, I, I don't know if it was last week or the week before that, that the sons of God were demons. I I'm not quite sure that that's the case. I think this could have been angels and then Satan accompanied him, them. He was also an angel. And the angels, I believe, were giving an account to God of their assignments and operations on earth. Because Hebrews 1.14 says, are they, that is the angels, not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. We know that there are some uh, angelic spirits who are in heaven all the time, like the created beings or uh, the cherubim and seraphim. But we know from Scripture, like in the book of Daniel, where there was a high-ranking angel that was fighting with one of the demonic high-ranking demons and he called for Michael to come help him in that struggle. And when Michael did that, then that other high-ranking angel could come to Daniel and he explains that. So this accounting provided an opportunity for Satan to come before God and if Satan accuses the brethren night and day, then he's very familiar with this arrangement. He's very familiar with approaching the throne of God. So notice in verse 6, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came among them. So why were these, these angels were here? Because God called for them. He called for them to present themselves. And Satan came at this significant time. That's what brought the sons of God to the throne room of God. And that is what brought Satan there. Notice also who initiated the conversation between God and Satan. So Satan came among them, and it says this, And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? Satan was the, or not Satan, but God was the initiator of the conversation with Satan. You could have put that kind of in a more common way of saying it. What have you been up to, Satan? What evil things have you been doing recently? But he said, Where, where have you been? Where do you come, from where do you come? And note, God does not react. It's not Satan approaching him and him reacting to that. God is acting and Satan is answering him. Now, what had Satan been doing? It says he had been going to and fro, from, to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. And this describes Satan's unrestrained roaming. But he has to have God's permissive act to do anything. That is to act upon something. He's roaming. He's observing. What is he observing? 
Yeah, he's observing us. He's observing the nations over which he has authority. That authority has been given to him by a higher authority. And that's God. So the whole world is Satan's realm of observation with the help of his demon. demons. He literally has eyes everywhere through the millions of demons. That third of the company of angels that was swept out of heaven and down to earth. And his description here of going to and fro on the earth and walking back and forth on it reminds us of a very important verse in 1 Peter where it says, Our adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith. Satan is on the prowl. That's what he's doing when he's walking to and fro throughout the whole earth. He's on the prowl. He's observing He's planning what he's going to say when he comes back and stands before God. Now, how do we resist him? Well, it's not by entering into dialogue with him. Or focusing on him, but by what does the scripture say? How do we overcome him? Keep your finger here because we're going to come right back here. Go to James chapter 4. James in chapter 4 talks about wars and fightings among them and He says, adulteresses and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, jealously, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God. The first step of resisting Satan is submitting to God. It says submit to God, and then it says resist the devil. And he will flee from you. How do we resist the devil? We resist the devil by obeying God. We resist the devil not again by dialoguing with him. There's really no example of that where a human being dialogues with Satan and wins. So he says, resist the devil. And we do that through the armor of God. We do that through the weapons that are not carnal but mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. Job never knew of his warfare going on in the heavenlies. All he knew was that he needed to deal with God. And that's what he wanted. He only knew one thing, and that is God allowed this. And so his his offense was with God. Our weapons and armor are mighty through God, not in fighting Satan personally, but in fighting by not giving him any ground. I mentioned before that Job was not even aware of what, what was going on. So how could he resist Satan personally? He couldn't. He wasn't even aware of it. And neither are we, which underscores that our victory is not won somehow by engaging Satan personally, but by submitting to God. 
Submission to God is always the first step of resisting Satan. And whatever we submit to God, we are resisting Satan. Through the scriptures, God makes us aware of what is going on behind the scenes. That's all we need to know. So we realize the strength and the danger of our enemy so that we rely on God and not on our own strength. That should cause us to be strong in the Lord because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places. Notice that Satan and God are not equals. We've pointed this out before, but I think we need to be reminded of it. Satan is not omniscient. Satan is not omnipresent. Satan is not omnipotent. He is a created being like Michael, the archangel. God is everywhere all at once. Satan is limited to one place at a time. God knows what Satan is doing and thinking all the time. Satan does not know what God is doing and thinking all the time. Satan only knows what God wants him to know. That's all. Satan is God's enemy, but not God's equal in power or wisdom or authority. Walter Kaiser in his book, More Hard Sayings of the Old Testament, says, there is profound meaning in representing Satan as appearing before God, for he is therefore designated as subordinate and in subjection to divine control. He cannot act on his own discretion or without any boundaries. He must receive permission from the sovereign Lord. That's why we're to submit to God. We are under the higher authority, the far more powerful authority. Third, regarding Satan walking to and fro throughout the whole earth, a, th a similar thing is said of God in 2 Chronicles 16.9. It says this, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. So these two descriptions of Satan and God mean two very different things. Satan has to travel. God doesn't. He sees it all from where he is. Satan seems to ceaselessly roam the earth, but it's not without the eye of God on him. Satan can't see God all the time, but God can see him all the time. And by the way, God sees us all the time too. So he knows what Satan is doing, trying to do to us. If, he, if, if Jesus Christ were here today, he could say to us, pointing to someone, he could say, get thee behind me, or he could say, Satan's on your shoulder right now, tempting you, because he knows all about that. The Bible says that while Satan stalks around the world in search of unsuspecting souls, the Lord thy God walks in the midst of your camp to deliver you and give your enemies over to you. The Bible also says that Angels patrol to and fro throughout the, the earth. Zechariah 1.10 and 6.7. And they also resist the efforts of Satan's demons and his plans, as we noted from Daniel 10.13. Satan's motive is to observe so he can accuse and tempt and slander and destroy us. God's motive is to observe 
so he can show himself strong on behalf of those who will trust him. That's very important. Satan must have God's permission to initiate any action toward us. Now think about that for a moment. If Satan wants to do anything to any of us, he has to first get God's permission. God needs no permission. He acts on his own sovereignty. He is infinitely greater in authority and power than Satan. There is no comparison. He is a, a created being by God. Secondly, the second or the third question I want us to answer is who brought up John's Job's name in the conversation? Look at verse 8. If you'll go back to Job. Verse 8, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? Again, I just want to say, God is not reactive. God is never reactive because he knows what's going to happen before it ever happens. He acts. And God asked, Have you considered the heart of my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth? And that's significant because we know that our trials or sufferings do not arise from Satan's whims, but out of the purposeful and loving hand of God, the one who doesn't take any joy in our suffering. Did you hear that? He takes no joy in our suffering. Lamentations 3, verses 32 and 37 written by Jeremiah who was looking on Jerusalem that, was, that laid in ruins. Many Jews had been slain. And he said this, though he, that's God, causes grief, yet he will show compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For he does not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. Now, you may be asking, well, didn't, didn't the Lord agree to this? Or didn't, you know, the Lord brought up, brought up Job. He gave permission. Wasn't that willingly? But we're going, to, we're going to delve into that next week and some of the harder, some of the harder questions that we, we have. And I want to remind us this morning that we aren't any different than Job in terms of the fact that Job, when put under pressure, had thoughts coming into his mind that he probably didn't like. He wasn't used to them. But the stress of the moment under all that he lost, not the least of which were his children, he began to question some things. And God was not afraid of that. But the scriptures say he does not afflict willingly nor grieve the children of men. God names Job because he was blameless and upright. That means that his, even his bringing up Job was a commendation of him. I wonder what God thinks of us. Job was this godly man of outstanding character. So in essence, God was commending Job. This is 
very similar to what Jesus did when approached by the Canaanite woman whose daughter was not doing well. And she came to the Lord and the Lord seemingly was putting her off. And he said to her, well, shall I give the bread that belongs to, in essence, he was saying the Jews, should I not give the bread to them or should I give it to the dogs? And this woman, it says, drew near and worshipped him. And she answered him by saying, but Lord, even the dogs under the table get the crumbs. And what he did was phenomenal. What he did was he commended her. He said, I have not seen such faith. Or he said, this, this is great faith. And in every instance where God commended somebody for their faith, it was a Gentile, not a Jew. So he was really commending this woman above any of the Jews to walk away from the Son of God and to know that he said, thy, great, thy, thy faith is great. Your faith is great. He was actually just pulling out of her. He wanted to commend her for her faith. And he knew he would. And she went home to see her daughter was living and healed. Would God speak as highly of you or me? Would he say, have you considered my righteous servant so-and-so? You're probably thinking, even as the thought came to my mind, I would just rather God leave my name out of it, all right? So I can avoid the trials. But God knows what we need. God knows what we need. That wasn't Job's response because Job didn't know what was going on. But it wasn't his response even when all the trials came. Notice what his first response was. Look at verse 20. Then Job arose. This is after he lost all of his wealth. He lost his children. And it says, Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. Now, friends, I don't want to suggest that this was an easy thing. He, he worshipped, and he was grieving. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. Now, friend, the theology that is given there is incredible. What he's saying there is that the God who gave us anything can take it all away and still be a righteous, holy God. But the Bible also says that God is not capricious. It says that God has a purpose for everything he does. And he has our welfare in mind, as well as his glory. And we often think, God gives it, and sometimes we even think, well, God's giving it because we've been good, and when he takes it away, we think he's unjust or mean. That was not Job's response. He said, God gives, he's merciful, God takes it away, 
He's just. He's merciful that he gave it while he gave it. Maybe, note, note that Satan knew of Job and slandered him as if it was fact. Now go back to verse 9. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands, and the possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. See, Satan thought he knew what Job would do and slandered him as though he had already done it in essence. And bitter people, evil people, often think everyone responds like they do. Everybody's going to act in the same manner that they do. And yet we see here that Job did not respond the way God or the way Job, um, Satan had said. God knew Job would not become bitter or curse God and give up his faith, but Satan didn't. In other words, the only reason Job, Job serves you is for the remuneration he gets in return, your payoffs. That's really what he was saying. Stop prospering him and he'll curse you and turn away. One commentator said he's holy for hire. He's holy for hire. Satan's implication is clear. Leighton Talbert in his book, The On Suffering, said this, who wouldn't go through the motion of fearing God with that kind of kickback to sweeten the deal? He's, he's speaking from Satan's perspective. The indictment oozes with insinuation, but not only against Job. After all, if God is omniscient, he cannot be scammed. If he knows Job's heart, then he is aware of the deception, yet he is paying off Job anyway. That can mean only one thing. God is complicit in Job's hypocrisy. Suddenly, neither Job nor God look very righteous. Satan's accusation is against Job on the surface, but it has a devilish undertow. Job and God are both scam artists. And I think that that is really what we need to see is the ultimate goal of Satan is not to take us down. He's only using us to try and take God down. Fourth question, who gave Satan permission to take all that Job had except to lay a hand on his person? I want you to notice that God did not tell him to do it, but he gave him power and limits to do what he was going to do. God says this to Satan, Behold, verse 12, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. He didn't tell him what to do. He just said, All that he has is in your power. Just don't lay a hand on his person. But note, God knew what Satan had in mind. But I also want you to note that even Satan put it in the language of God doing it. Look in verse 11. Here's Satan speaking, but now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you. So Satan was even, he saw it. He had to come to God for, for permission, and if God allowed that, he was going to blame God for what happened. So 
So by God's permission, Satan took it as far as the leash would go, all the way to taking his children. He did as much destruction as he possibly could in order to ensure that, that Job would curse God. I also want you to notice that God took ownership of it himself. The second time Satan comes before God, he asks him the same question. He says, from where do you come? Verse 2 of chapter 2. And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? And there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil and still holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. Interesting, isn't it? That these trials come from God is substantiated by Job throughout the whole book. We know he didn't know about this conversation between God and Satan. His, he wanted a chance to address God. Look at chapter 1, verse 20. We, we just read this. Then Job arose, tore his robe shaved his head and he fell on the ground and worshiped and he said naked I came from my mother's womb and naked shall I return the Lord gave and the Lord is taken away he didn't blame Satan he blamed God he wasn't really blaming him here obviously he was acknowledging low that God had allowed it God had done it notice also in chapter 2 verse 9 and 10, this is his wife speaking, and his wife says to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. And friends, that's after the boils. That's after Satan had made his life even more miserable. But notice also, in chapter 6, verse 4, this is a dialogue going between Job and Eliphaz. Chapter 6. Verse 4, and this is Job's answer to Eliphaz. And he says, for the arrows of the Almighty are within me. My spirit drinks in their poison. The terrors of God are arrayed against me. Notice also in chapter 10, this is a conversation with Bildad, one of his other friends. And look at verse 2 and 3. I will say to God, do not condemn me. Show me why you contend with me. Does it seem good to you that you should oppress, that you should despise the work of your hands and smile on the counsel of the wicked? You see, he, he knows his theology. He knows that it's from God. As I mentioned, we're going to delve into this a little bit more next week. The Bible says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. And the, most, the three most important words, or four most, three most important words are the next phrase, but God is faithful. It still stands. Now, friends, we, we have to realize that God, the same trial is used by both Satan and God. It's used by Satan to tempt. 
It's used by God to test. Now, we don't like the test, generally speaking. But tests are what life is made of, aren't they? If you were to apply to be a Navy SEAL, you would be put to the test. They, they work for years to get physically fit enough to go through the strenuous things that they have to do. Seth, our son, was, uh, wanted to be a chaplain for the Rangers. And he, he started through that process. He didn't make it. It's very rigorous. And why do they do that? They don't just say, okay, you're in. Because they're going to be doing things that are going to be physically demanding. That's why they have tests to, that are up to the level of those, what they're going to be assigned to, life-threatening situations. And they've, they've got to know that these guys are not going to knuckle under it at the stress, that they're going to be able to pull through it all. Tests are what life is made of. The difference is the motive when, when Satan takes us through those trials. He does it to destroy us. He has a whole different motive. When God takes us through that trial, he does it to perfect us. He does it to make us better. He does it to teach us more about himself and even more about ourselves. And when we do go through it, trusting him, at the end, we're glad we went through it. It wasn't fun, but we're glad we went through it. Again, Leighton Talbert in his book makes five points to contrast God's character and Satan's character based on the book of Job. And listen to these. He says, God notes our actions and knows our motives. Satan scrutinize our, scrutinizes our actions and suspects our motives. Secondly, God loves and pities and defends us before Satan. Satan hates and accuses us before God. Third, God grants permission and sovereign confidence that Job would not sin against God. Satan is a liar and a cheat who tries to change the rules to save face and win. Do you know what he means by that? God, Satan came and said, if you do this, he's going to curse you. God gave him permission and he didn't. Job didn't admit he was wrong, or not Job, but Satan didn't admit he was wrong. What he did is, oh, okay, that's because you limited me you, you let me touch his person. If you touch his person, then he'll curse you. See, Satan wasn't owning up to anything. He, he simply avoided it. He dodged it and then slandered him again. Number four, God alone grants, withholds, and regulates permission while Satan's evil designs are circumscribed by the consent of God. Do you understand what he's saying? God alone grants, withholds, and regulates permission while Satan's evil designs are always poised behind God. He's saying, God did it. Satan always frames his evil designs on the consent of God. He blames God. He never takes responsibility. And then number five, God is always good in his designs and gracious in his disposition. Satan is cruel whenever unleashed and given the opportunity. 
And these, this is all backed up by the book of Job in these first two chapters. Robert Bell, professor, the theology professor, said this. He said, Satan would have us believe that God is not fair, yet we seldom consider the cruelty of the devil. I have never met any, anyone bitter about what Satan has done to him, but I've met many who were bitter towards God. That's because Satan always pins it on God, even though it's his suggestion. Now, Job struggled, didn't he? When he was put through this process, he struggled, even as each of us would and do sometimes. And I want to just impress upon us this morning, all of us, that God knows what he's doing. And that as we look at the book of Revelation and we see the incredible ravages that the people on earth are going to go through and even Believers, those who have become believers during the tribulation. And you can look at that and you can say, how could God allow that? And the answer to that question is always that there's more than just that life. There's something beyond it. There's a hope. And we have God, that we have Jesus Christ himself who endured And he endured the worst of things. And he says, consider him who endured even to the shedding of blood. And he, he says, how many, of, have, how many of us have done that? So as we look at this, I want us to realize too that it's not just trials that God brings into our lives, it may also be trials that we bring into our life because of sin. Because the Bible expresses to us that if we're a believer, God doesn't waste any trials. And sometimes he allows us to go into sin in order to teach us the ravages of sin, so that we will turn away from it. We have stories of that in Scripture. And the most important thing that we can do is respond to those things, whether it be God bringing ordained things in or whether it is us bringing things in because we've chosen a path that God did not want us to go. God wants us to follow him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the lessons that we learned from Job's life. We thank you, Lord, that even though Satan is the accuser of the brethren, our God is the one who forgives and sanctifies and is bringing our lives ultimately to glorification. Help us, Lord, to trust you. And even in these days, Lord's, where, Lord, where things seem so unstable, help us to respond in a way that is glorifying to you May we be lights in this world, even as Job was. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like you to turn into, in the, to the flyleaf of your of your hymnal to the song, I Am With You. 
And I'm choosing this because it was born out of great trial, this song, this hymn was. Words would be very similar. I am with you, says the Father, through the floods I calm and keep. And God is with us. If we are believers, God is with us. He is working in our lives. He has laid a firm foundation for us that the choir sang about this morning. And what more can he say than what he has given us in his word? Let's all stand together as we sing, I am with you. And I hope that you'll identify yourself in this, even though you might not be in the midst of a deep trial, but there are some that may be. And I would challenge you that no matter what has happened in your life, that you realize that God can take what we think are sometimes the shattered pieces of a life and he can mold them together and make them something that glorifies him. Let's sing it together. I am with you. I am with you, says the Father. Through the floods I calm and keep. Though the swelling waves surround you, I surround the waters deep. Fear not, loved one, feel my presence. You will never be alone. Trust me, loved one, you are precious. You are mine, my very own. Let's sing that third stanza as the last. I am with you, says the Spirit. There is nowhere you can flee. Neither height nor depth can hide you. Every place is home to me. Fear not, loved one, hear my witness. You are God's own child and heir. Trust me, loved one, hear my whisper. Deep within you I am here. Every Christian who has ever gone, who has ever gone through deep trial and is in heaven today would tell you it's worth it. Chuck Phelps' son and daughter-in-law died in that bus accident. We don't need to grieve for them. They're enjoying every part of heaven. And they would tell us here it's worth every minute of whatever we go through. And we need to keep that in mind. That's why eternity is the, it's the whole thing that makes it all worth it. If all we had was this life, we are of most men, we are of men most miserable. But because of eternity, it is worth it. It's not even worthy to be compared to it. Let's remember that. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your precious word. Lord, you have given us these windows into your throne room, into the spirit of our enemy who wants to destroy us. Lord, we thank you that he is under your control and not ours. I pray that you will give us a heavenly perspective. I pray that you would encourage us. I pray that if there are those here this morning that are in the midst of a, a personal trial, that they will look to you and trust you and please you in it and not please themselves. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen.